Thank you for joining us for episode four of Rhino's Horn, the podcast where we interview Canadian comedians and politicians. My guest this week is Member of Parliament for Toronto Danforth and the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Canadian Heritage, Ms. Julie DeBrusen. We have a great talk about uh, what Parliament is like now operating over Zoom, uh, how important it is for individuals to reach out to their MPs when trying to affect change, and what net zero by 2050 actually entails. We have a great chat. This is my first time interviewing an actual member of Parliament. I am very nervous. Thank you again for joining us. Please enjoy. How are you doing? I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. I think it's amazing. Like, I know it sounds trite to say, but there is something to be said for the fact that sunny weather changes everything. Yeah. Yeah, when you've been stuck inside for so long. Uh, and yeah. the sun, the sunshine was kind of late this year, I guess. So it... Yeah, yeah. Anyway, so it just, that I, it's been a happy day so far. I'm glad to hear that. And I said so, so far. So far, <laughs> yes, right. It's still pretty early, yeah. <laughs> and so what's your, what's your quarantine routine kind of looking like? So, you know, some parts are, it, it's really funny, isn't it? So in some ways I feel so effective because I'm now working out at 6.15 in the morning a whole bunch. Oh, wow. Be- because there is no way in regular life I would ever wake up like at 5.15 in the morning or whatever, roll out of bed and, you know, mm-hmm. bike out somewhere to work out. Sure. But now, like, all I have to do, I wake up, I'm out of bed at 6.10 and I'm there for class at 6.15. Right, so, yeah. That's funny. The commute times are a lot shorter. Yeah, tough to be late these days. Yeah. <laughs> yeah but uh, yeah, and then otherwise, I find the funny part, I don't know about you, but the day kind of just slides, you know, like I can end yeah. up working a lot. I just keep working throughout the day because there's no regular pacing to it. Yeah, it's funny how they've all kind of blended into each other. Like we were talking about nine, 10 weeks now. It's insane. Yeah. Week 10, I just passed, it was really cute. It was, um, I was in a lane way. And yeah. I guess some kid is posting art every week. Like they have little clothespins. And so the kid had posted week 10 art. That's how I knew it was week 10. <laughs> <laughs> they oh, updated every week. So nice. Yeah, we've been starting to do little jogs around the neighborhood. And I see a lot of those. I didn't realize that they were turning over. It makes sense though, that they, every week. Yeah, yeah. That's absolutely. So, that's so cute. And so what does work look like? How? How does the House of Commons operate? Yeah, uh, so the House of Commons piece is a bit strange because we're on all on Zoom now, right. which it's kind of disengaged in some ways, you know. So we do those meetings, um, online meetings on Tuesdays and Thursdays um, in the afternoons, like about two and a half hours those two days. Mm-hmm. And, and it's just a giant Zoom call with like 300 members of parliament on it kind of oh thing. Oh my God, that must um, be insane. It is like the giant Brady Bunch. It's pretty hilarious like <laughs> when everybody finally like starts popping up onto the screen. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of cool. But, you know, normally in the House of Commons, there could be some negative to the whole heckling thing. Sure. But there's also just the interactivity of how you see how things land. I guess, you know, you can read people's faces, you can kind of get a sense of how people are reacting. Right. Different on a screen. You don't have that. Like every now and then I can do what my little reactions, so I can do this, but yeah. (laughs) Right. (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) Yeah. It's a little bit, that part's different. Yeah, that's interesting. Similar to comedy, because there's a lot of online comedy rooms now too, and it's the same, like you don't feel the energy of the room and uh, it's it's tough. harder to read I guess yeah that, that must be actually really hard eh? because a lot of stand-up and, and even is is that interaction with the audience right yeah yeah I haven't been able to bring myself to do any of the zoom comedy shows yet but from what I've heard it's uh, it's a much different uh, beast mm-hmm. and so do you feel like it's more or less civilized in terms of heckling and uh, things like that for for, for the House of Commons part, um, so there, there really isn't heckling because, I mean, I guess you could turn off your, you could unmute yourself and everybody could start jeering. It has happened, it has happened a couple of times. Is that right? Um, that has happened, but overall, not so much. Yeah. Um, but there's definitely, 
it's a different style because normally in the House of Commons, you have, you know, like say 45 seconds to ask you a question, 45 seconds to answer. It's very like beep, beep, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, now you have five minutes for an exchange. Oh. So in some ways, in some ways, it, you actually get a little bit more back and forth, which isn't bad. Yeah. But the part that people have cottoned on to, which isn't as good, is the length of the answer is the length of your question, like the time back and forth. So if, so if I ask you a question, it's very short. Yeah. Then you only have that short time to answer before it goes back to my next question. Oh, that's um, interesting. And that part actually makes it a little bit less civil in some ways because you don't, you can ask a really complex question. Yeah. But very short. And then how do you answer that? Yeah, especially in such a short amount of time. What, now, what is the rationale behind that? Um, it wasn't, it was so that no one talks down the clock, which you can understand. The other part is you ask me a question like that, what's the rationale about that? And I talk to you for the next four minutes and 45 seconds about <laughs> the, you the entire time, right? Where they <laughs> read Dr. Seuss books or whatever it is. <laughs> exactly. Interesting. Exactly. Okay. Well, so, so these are all new challenges that you guys are kind of, it's like a different set of rules, I guess. Yeah. It's a, it's a different way of doing things. So it's, there's, in anything, there's a bit some good, some less good. Yeah. yeah. And now, so this is a minority parliament, and I've noticed, at least it seems to me, being on the outside, that there's a less partisan approach to the COVID-19 thing. Certainly from the people are, are all staying home regardless of stripe. Do you, <laughs> do you feel that that is kind of reflected in the House of Commons too, where the MPs are working together even in this minority parliament or not so much? I actually do think so. I do think so. And especially like, as we're dealing with the emergency measures, absolutely, because people recognize you might have a whole bunch of conversations after the fact. I'm sorry, my kids are putting things in a dishwasher. No, of course, yeah. Which is actually great. I'm encouraging that. I'm not discouraging the dishwasher. <laughs> <laughs> just the clanging you hear in the background is that. Sure. Um, so, you know, there can be discussions, especially after the fact of, was there a different way about it, you know, on, on any response? But, but what we're working on, everybody, everybody knows we're working on the same problem. If we're working on an unemployment issue. We're dealing with an economic issue. We're dealing with a health issue. You know, so there's, I think, a little bit more of an ability for everybody to get on the same page and work together. Yeah. yeah. Well, that, that, that seems encouraging from the outside looking in. It's, uh... Yeah. And, you know, it is good. And, and there is still push and pull. And that's not a bad thing. Yeah. Right? Like, that's not a bad thing. Like, that's what makes, you know, it's good to have people pushing and saying, that's not the best way around this problem. Right, yeah. but there's just a civilized way to do it. Yep. And it sounds like maybe people are being a little more civilized about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. That's so great. Now, you are uh, the parliamentary secretary to the Minister of Canadian Heritage, right? That is right. What does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> what does it mean? It, it means that basically I help the minister in his mandate, so... Um, I mean, different things. Like if you talk about on the parliamentary side, what we were just talking about, if he was unable to attend um, a question period or something of the sort, then I'm the person who takes the questions on his behalf. So it can be in that kind of a scenario. But it also means that, for example, um, when we're trying to get feedback on different policies, develop different policies, I'll also help him out in reaching out to people. Um, there are certain issues that I care about really deeply, like copyright. Mm -hmm. So that's something that I'm taking a bit more of a lead on. And he's still the final decision maker. He's a minister, but I can kind of put together what, what I think is the right road plan on things like that. Uh -huh. I see. And how, does, how do you think COVID is impacting the Canadian heritage? Like, do you see this as an opportunity or... Um, you know what, I think, so th the reason I'm kind of parsing out is it's a little bit of both. I mean, in many ways, and you kind of pointed out even yourself, when it comes to, to stand-up comedy, um, you know, live performances are among the first to shut down, mm -hmm. and it's going to take, you know, a long road to open them up and have them full of people and, you know, 
having even a comedy performance, say in a bar with five people is not the same as a packed place. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Right? So, um, so in, I wouldn't want to say too much about opportunity in the sense that I think there are really huge challenges facing the industry as a whole. Yeah. Um, and, and safety challenges too, about how do you keep your artists safe? How do you keep the audiences safe? But yeah. on the other hand, people have been particularly focused on watching television, listening to music, you know, watching movies. So yeah. there are opportunities. Um, and I wonder if we're traveling less between countries, if there's more of an opportunity for people to discover the Canadian live content. That's kind of what I was thinking that maybe it's a, you know, a grassroots thing where we got to entertain ourselves or whatever. <laughs> yeah. So, so a mixed bag, right? Mm -hmm. I think we'll have to try and make some lemonade. Yeah, absolutely. And it's interesting, the challenges, because we're talking about theater and live performances, but even restaurants, I imagine, uh, with such a, a thin profit margin, you mm -hmm. know, these kinds of limiting of capacity and things like that, I worry that they may not be able to, to get through it. But. Yeah, no, no, it's hard. You know, one really cool thing is one of the theaters in my community over here, Crow's Theater, has partnered up with the restaurant um, Gare de l'Est, which is in their same space, mm -hmm. well, same space, like adjoining spaces. But so Gare de l'Est and Crow's Theater have actually partnered up and they're doing dinner and theater at home. And they will deliver a meal to you from Gare de l'Est. Oh. And then you will stream a performance that's actually happening live, I believe, from Crow's Theater. So, oh, wow. That's really cool. Yeah, I'm checking one out. On June 3rd, I'm, I'm watching. It's one about people who are competitive eaters. Oh, you wow. Know, right. Hot dog eaters. Sure. Yeah, yeah, that sounds interesting. Yeah, it's yeah. interesting to see how some places have shifted. Like I heard Second City is now doing teaching courses online and they're accepting people from all over now, um, not just people who live in Toronto, because why not? Right? Online. So, so rural people might have more opportunities mm -hmm. without having to come to the city. Yeah, rural people, also people from different countries. He said there were people from California and things like that who were so... It's interesting to see how people have pivoted or businesses mm -hmm. have pivoted, I guess. Yeah. And now your work with the Canadian Association of Stand-Up Comedians. What do you think is the best way for comedians to be advocating for themselves on like an individual level? And I realize that with COVID, it may be a little different. But let's say that COVID wasn't here and the industry was what it was. Yeah. What do you think is the best way for an individual comedian to advocate for themselves? I'll say before and after COVID, like you know, and during as well, reach out to your local MPs, um, reach out to your local electeds, because that does have an impact. That's how I got involved in this, was the comedian in, in my community reaching out and, and flagging what the issues were. I'd never even thought about it. Mm. And I think it's really effective because first of all, just like I said, it, it, it creates awareness, but it also creates awareness about it being an issue in the community as opposed to an issue at large. Right. And that has a real grounding effect. And so people underestimate a, how easy it is to reach out to whoever is your elected, you know, federal MP or you want provincial MPP. Um, it, it's not that hard. To, to reach out in, in this context, obviously it's going to be a bit more of the zoom call phone call kind of situation. Right, yeah. But, um, and it really does have an impact. Like, I see it too, because I see it when I am talking to someone, say I'm talking about comedy, you know, issues about comedians and about live performance spaces. And somebody will say, Oh, you know, I was talking to someone in my community, you know, or I heard that interview on the radio. Right. It, it kind of grounds it a little bit more. Right, I guess makes it less of an abstract thing and more of a, a personal thing. You, you are the uh, member of parliament for Dan, the Toronto Danforth, right? That's right. I imagine that would be a pretty affected area uh, with, because it feels pretty densely populated. What kind of things have you been seeing in the riding, either the community coming together or the challenges that are being faced? Hmm. So... A bit of both. I, we were talking a bit before about the hospitality industry. We have huge hospitality industry in this riding because if you think about 
Lazyville, Riverside, Greek Town, the Danforth, pay, but just Gerard Street, Little India, uh, we ha East Chinatown. I mean, really, so many areas that rely on restaurant industry and just walking traffic to go to our retail stores. Yeah. So that's been a really big issue that, that I have seen and heard about a lot over the past bit. Um, as far as, and, and, and you know what, health concerns. People yeah. really concerned about what does this mean for me? How do I keep my family safe? How do I keep myself safe? So those are kind of key issues, the economic impacts, right? Like right. about people who've lost employment or who have had to have changed employment, childcare, suddenly right. people being at home, um, not having childcare and having to try and work from at home at the same time. Right. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I see like, you know, over and over again, just, it, it can be a challenge. So that part, but also seeing community come together in, in, really amazing ways um so our local hospital the michael garen hospital had a call for um masks homemade masks right people have been sewing away who knew that many people <laughs> knew how to sew <laughs> I don't. Uh, but people have been sewing away i think they were saying that they've received sixty thousand or something like oh wow enormous number of masks and it's and and in all kinds of different patterns and so that's cool. Yeah, it's very cool. Yeah. Um, and also, uh, you know, some people in the community had this thing because kids are bored trying to find ways to entertain them, um, coming up with different themes of things to put in their windows every day so kids could go for a walk and check out different things in windows. You know, just fun ideas. Yeah, people are getting really creative. Yeah. That's very cool. I um, I was taking the subway because I for a while I was going to work and – I noticed uh, a lot of homeless people kind of out, and I don't know if it's maybe it, they're more noticeable because there's less people out, so they're. Mm. But do you know what? I, this is just a, a question I had, and I don't know who else to ask. Do you know what's being done to support people in, in those situations? Um, yeah, a little bit. I, at the city level, I can't probably get into the granular detail in the same way, and it ends up being federal support for province and city, like as to how it all works out. Right, yeah. um, there was there was federal support for even trying to provide better protections within existing shelters. But there are also, um, I don't know if you've heard or seen, uh, but there are hotels being opened up to be used as shelter spaces as well. I just saw recently, just in the past week, there was one in the beach that was opened up as a shelter for women. Okay. So. There are additional spaces, but there are challenges still, no question. Yeah, because I know there was one over by Comedy Bar that it looks like it's boarded up and closed. I imagine, really? well, I imagine they couldn't, um, and, and to be fair, I'm not sure what the what they, services they actually provided, but I imagine it was difficult to maintain the social distancing inside mm -hmm. because they, they seemed very busy all the time. Yeah. Issues about meal programs, and the like too, right? And how mm. I was talking with one food bank and they were saying one of their challenges, a lot of the volunteers who used to work in their food bank were seniors. Oh. So couldn't really be people who would be now venturing out in public quite as much. Right. So for a little while, they had a challenge and then it pivoted because suddenly this new group of people had time on their hands. Um, so right. you know, now they, they, it's just a different group of people, but there was a bit of this shift in right. between yeah so now and i don't know if you have a feel for this but is there a feeling kind of in parliament that because I, I hear a lot of people talking about how this can be an opportunity to kind of change the way that we operate and certainly i know from an environmental perspective that's something that you care about mm -hmm. uh, do you see this as an opportunity to kind of restructure things in a way that's more like harmonious yeah, well, on, on a few different kinds of paces, I think I've been really excited to see in the city, for example, a lot more focus on how do we open up our streets for, for people to walk and to cycle um, and ways to get around that, um, that keep us physically distanced. But it also creates that opportunity. I think Transform TO had this goal of, oh, I'm going to make this get stronger. It's a city goal. But I think it was something like, 
trying to get 75% of the trips under five kilometers to be through active transportation, something like that, right? Oh, okay. To really try and get us walking and cycling more for the shorter distance kind of commutes. And this is an opportunity to make that happen mm -hmm. because suddenly people are discovering their bikes more, walking around more, we're, we're doing different things with our spaces and our streets. So that's pretty exciting and can have a really direct impact. And now I saw you speaking about net zero by 2050. Yeah. What, what is that? Can you explain that initiative to me? Uh, so the goal would be that we would have as a country, like net zero emissions. It means that it's not, it's not actually zero emissions. There are some places where you're going to have to have some kind of offsets, but, but that you would actually have a goal to, to head towards that carbon neutrality. So it, it means things like, well, a bit of how I was saying about the active transportation piece. Uh, the, the other really important piece, you don't really think about it as much, but from a city perspective, our largest emitters are our buildings. Oh. So how do we, you know, so how do we support retrofitting our buildings, um, making our buildings more efficient? Really? That would actually have the largest impact. Really? Um, are our cities on that? Yeah, it's transportation and house and, and buildings. Yeah. Buildings being actually number one. Wow. And so what kind of changes would you make? Can you make to buildings to? Well, the, there is actually was part of our part of our plans. And if you look at mandate letters, I can actually get those to you if you're interested too. I don't know if you see there's you can look up the mandate letters for all the ministers, which is like what is their task list? Right. But, um, so there was actually a retrofit piece to it. Um, we don't necessarily mandate exactly what the retrofit is, but you just kind of help support it happening. But it would be things like changing windows or better insulation in buildings or different ways of heating. I, I discovered a couple of years ago that all of our downtown hospitals and many of our downtown buildings are actually cooled through a deep lake cool water system that actually mm. pulls water from the lake oh. down deep circulate through these pipes and it becomes our drinking water so oh. you know it kind of circulates through the pipes keeps buildings cold and then ends up in our water system because um, oh. it's clean so it's a really cool system um and and actually does reduce emissions oh. and you know so there are ideas like that that work and that's what's happening right now or that... that's happening right now oh interesting it was being expanded. That's why I found out about it was because there was um, federal funding to support expanding oh. the network for it. And so I went and I actually got to see the giant pipes. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that is very cool. And so yeah. net zero, how far away are we from that now? We're far. I mean, very the goal far. is 2050. Well, no, I mean, if you want me to be. I do. Uh, <laughs> we have a while to go. We absolutely have a, a while to go. Um, and, and the goal is 2050, which even then, that's a while to go, yeah. right? But, um, but I feel hopeful too, that people are really thinking about it more yeah. and, and, and that there's the, the technologies are there and developing. I, I'm also hopeful. Yeah, yeah, because it's not, it feels, especially now, it's not that we can't, it, it really is a choice now. Do we invest time and energy or do we not? Yeah. And, and there's the, you know, and some of it might be some lifestyle change. Um, you know, it, it, that you, however, being choices of what we were just talking about, about how do you get around? So some of it's lifestyle change. Um, it's not just all on the individual. I worry sometimes about that balance. Like, sure, we should use less single use plastics. That's not a climate change issue, but it is environmental that I care about. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's also on industry putting out less single-use plastics, <laughs> right? So right. Like, there's always a balance. Yes, it's my decision to ride a bike, but it's also on a larger scale, making sure that we're doing the infrastructure piece for all that too. Right, that there's trails and things like that. So from an individual perspective, what can we do though? Uh, what do you think is the best thing for an individual? On the climate change side? Yeah, on the net zero hmm. goal. So some of them I was talking to you about, the active transportation piece, check out in your housing, you know, things like not, not cranking up the heat or the air conditioning and all those pieces. Those are the individual pieces because you asked individual. Yeah. Um, 
I would guess that, you know what, one part of it is still probably making more plant-based choices. Uh, the, uh, the I, well, I can't remember, the IPCC, uh, they did a study actually on the impact of agriculture and our food choices on the on climate change. And there is there is an impact. Yeah. So it might be that from a health perspective or whatever, make some of those choices. Less food waste. Right. Okay. Shocking amount of methane comes from food waste. And buy local. But also take into account what what can you do and what can you afford. Like I, I don't like imposing guilt on people either. Right. right all about what what you're capable of there's a larger piece it's not just all on the individual right but just i'm thinking areas that people c can start thinking about like oh what what are what are the decisions that i'm making and what can i what am i able to do mm -hmm. there i and i'd say check out the resources right like support support some of your local local your advocacy like Citizens Climate Lobby is this group that came around when I was first elected. They came to my office to advocate for um, carbon pricing, mm -hmm. and and uh, they came by. And they did a really great job of activating local people in the community to get out there and and to activate and to learn more about it. Uh, so there's also you know there are great local groups doing work, planting trees, caring for existing trees, mm -hmm. you know those kind of things. Yeah, it's pretty encouraging. Certainly in my lifetime, I've seen the conversation just continue to grow and mm -hmm. more and more people talking about the environment, which, again, is encouraging in and of itself. Yeah. Uh, the virus might be nature's way of uh, reminding us that she's there. You know, I, I think it, it is always a good thing for us to take stock. And perhaps that's, you know, you were asking what what is this moment for thinking about how we do things differently? It, it is a bit of a moment of pause, right? We have changed and disrupted the way we do things in a very big way. Uh, and that's not necessarily a bad place for all of us to think individually and as a country about what are our priorities and do we, are they the same? It, it might not always be. That's true. Mm -hmm. Well, Mr. Bruce, and thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me. Thank you. Yeah, well, let me know how you're doing with uh, if you decide to do a Zoom comedy show. I will. I will. I will let you know. You'll be the first to know. <laughs> and, uh, good luck with the virtual parliament. Thank you very much. I'll talk okay. to you soon. Okay, thanks so much. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining us. If you'd like to follow us on social media, we are Rhino's Horn on Instagram, Rhino's Horn on YouTube, on Facebook, we are Rhino's Horn, and on Twitter, we are at Horny Voter. Please join us next week. My guest will be comedian Graham Kay. Graham is originally from Ottawa, but he's done stand-up comedy in Toronto, Los Angeles, and is now in New York City. Graham is very funny, and we have a very good conversation, which I'm sure you will enjoy. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next week.